Greetings and welcome to Bloomberg New Economy Conversations, the series where we explore how businesses and governments around the world are responding to the coronavirus pandemic. In today's conversation, we'll take a look at emerging markets which are facing a historic crisis, some say an existential threat. We've got a terrific lineup of speakers joining us today, so we're going to get right into the discussion. If you've joined us for our conversation series before, don't be fooled by my slick new backdrop. As always, I'm joining you from rural New Hampshire, which is a long way from Bloomberg headquarters in New York City. I'd like to welcome our global community of Bloomberg economy delegates who've attended the forum in Beijing and Singapore these past two years. We also welcome the thousands of listeners tuning in on social media and via the Bloomberg terminal. There will be opportunities throughout this conversation for real-time input from you, our audience. I encourage you to submit questions in the text box in the bottom right of your screen, and I'll invite you to vote in live polling in the top right of your screen. If at any point you encounter technical difficulties, a simple refresh of your browser should help get things back on track. Later in the program, we'll bring you recorded interviews with the Inter-American Development Bank President Luis Alberto Moreno and global economist Dambisa Moyo. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce our two guests, Josephine Wapakabulo. Uh, 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 Josephine is the founder and the managing director of TIG Africa, a Dubai-based consulting firm. She previously served as the founding CEO of Uganda's national oil company. Josephine, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you for having me. Hendrik Dutois. Hendrik is the founder and CEO of 91, a South African-based asset management business, which demerged from parent company Investec and publicly listed on the London and Johannesburg stock exchanges in March. Welcome to the program, Hendrik. Thank you, Andy, and uh, good afternoon, listeners. Hendrik, I'd like to start with you. You, as I, I mentioned, you just listed an investment business focused on emerging markets in the midst of a historic crisis in the developing world. On the other hand, emerging markets have never been cheaper. Between despair and hope, from an investment perspective, how should we look at emerging markets right now? Andy, Firstly, there is always a crisis somewhere when you're an investor. And, uh, you know, building a business and serving the long-term investment needs of, 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 of asset owners uh, doesn't wait, doesn't stop. You need to do it. So right now, of course, the asset class is very cheap. Emerging markets are challenged largely by not because of their own doing, but by the lack of global leadership in this particular crisis. Um, but I would remind you that emerging markets, uh, you know, th this is definitely not an existential threat. We've seen enormous progress in per capita incomes, in living standards across the world, and particularly in emerging markets. And that is not going to stop. It may pause. It may uh, lead to, to pressures on individual companies or individual countries. Um, you know, I'm talking to you sitting in rural New Hampshire. The U.S. was once the most exciting emerging market in the world, may I remind, when China dominated the global economy. Yeah, so, uh, okay, people have been writing off emerging markets for decades, but this time, surely, it is different. I mean, it's a cascading series of crises. It's a health crisis. It's a financial crisis. It's an economic crisis. We're in the middle of a trade war between, or a financial war, which we'll talk about later, between the U.S. and China. How do you? How do we look at, at this crisis? I mean, could this be the one that might conceivably bring down the emerging market universe? Well, I, I don't think so. But it's, it's an ever-changing universe. If you look at emerging markets in two thousand. It was dominated, the indices were dominated by Latin America. China had, uh, you know, in the 1980s, four public, four listed stocks. Today, China has more public companies than the United States of America, actually more than, about double the number. 
It has a capital market, second largest in the world. Um, that's an emerging market. India, you've seen even this week the, the vast investments that Facebook is putting into India right now, um, going for after the payment system there. But there will be a difference and of course, emerging markets now are completely dominated by Asia rather than Latin America. Africa has always been pretty light, pretty small, except for when South Africa came in in 94 and the Asian countries weren't as recognized as they probably should have been at that point. And, and so I would think an emerging market is exactly like an investing in the developed world. It's all about picking the right assets, the right businesses. When you today see technology companies dominate the world. I must remind you that, you know, in the top 10 technology companies, there are at least three one, uh, companies that came from the emerging markets. And I, you know, if you look at mobile telephony, whether it's pre or post Huawei, Samsung is still there. You know, so, so this, is a, this is a game. The world is, is actually becoming a, 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 a comp more complicated place because it's not simple, it's not flat anymore. There's not one s system of rules. And I think I'm really worried about the rules-based system breaking down because that will stop the growth and the development of the poorer countries rather than affect the rich countries initially. But in the long run, it will affect everyone. So what we need to do is reset a global order which reflects the political realities of the world and the economic realities, and, and one thing we do know is the world is shifting towards Asia, and Asia is the center of emerging markets. So there's absolutely, it's the same trade that Marco Polo had. It's the same trade that the British East India Company had, and that trade is not about to end. Okay, I want to put up a graphic uh, for you both to take a look at. Actually, Hendrik, it comes, I think, I believe from, uh, uh, from your your uh, uh, research division, um, which looks at the, the 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 universe of emerging markets, talk us through this and and how should we interpret this? I mean, really, this this chart is just trying to show. I'm sorry to use my glasses, and you're going to spot that I have reached the age where I have to use glasses to look at a chart in front of me. But it's really about fiscal strength and. Uh, the composite health score. And it's very interesting that, uh, you know, there are very few countries in the bottom left, which is the weakest, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, health, uh, health issues plus fiscal risks. And really, Brazil is the standout. And that's the real vulnerable place where you, you probably have a quite healthy young population. In spite of the huge COVID numbers we've seen, it's still per capita much lower than the European experience, much, much lower. And also it's a country with more space, but it's fiscally vulnerable. Similarly, South Africa has moved into the fiscally vulnerable space with picking up the size of the, 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 the um, bubble tells you, uh, you know, uh, the significance of the issue. And you can see it, it's picked up because they, the, the COVID cases have picked up, but it's still extremely small. So I would say the emerging market issue remains a fiscal issue. The developed world issue was largely a health issue. And then older demographics do worse. Fortunately, the, older, the, the countries with the older demographics like Russia have more resilient fiscal positions. So it becomes a picking of a country, picking of the business, as opposed to a, a bland statement, all emerging markets are suffering or all developed. And I might remind you that for the 2020, developed world economic growth forecasts are far worse an emerging market forecast. I think the 2021 would be really interesting to see whether the bounce back would be the similar or whether emerging markets would lose their edge. Josephine, um, let's pick up on this sort of glass half full, half empty theme. Obviously, we can't lump all, as, as Hendrik said, we can't lump all emerging markets together. In fact, it's interesting, several of the biggest emerging markets China, South Korea, Taiwan have been the most successful uh, in combating COVID-19 and are now leading the global recovery. But tell us about Africa. How do we understand Africa? I mean, we were getting dire, dire warnings from the United Nations. Uh, um, uh, they, pro they projected a billion or more infections, millions of deaths, multiple famines, societal collapse, including in 
in sort of in, in, in fragile states and conflict zones, but that doesn't seem to have, have happened. What What is the situation then? So, I mean, it's, a, it's an excellent question, Andy, because I, I think, like you said, if you go back to where we were in March, everyone had the dire predictions. And I, I think um, since then we've seen, I think we're at about 140, 150, 145,000 cases, um, 4,500 deaths across Africa, particularly in the north and in the south. Um, so I think, it, you know, there'll be ongoing debates and there's not enough data to definitively say why or why not. But what we can say is, I think because many African countries knew about the fragility of their healthcare systems, a lot of them were taking action sort of late February earlier. Um, you go to places like Uganda, Senegal, Ghana, there was a lot of countries that took initiative to lock down um, in sort of very highly pressured, highly delicate decisions that impacted the economies, but they realized if we didn't close our borders um, with our fragile healthcare systems, we could have had the catastrophe that's predicted. Now, we still don't know if there'll be a resurgence. We hope not, but there are still some scientists that say they may be. For now, um, it seems on the whole, on a slightly more general scale, if you look at the data, there's been relatively good containment. We're seeing economies are starting to open up. Um, but we can't underestimate the sort of uh, social impact in terms of the nature of our informal economies, the nature of our very um, densely populated cities with the urban poor and the impact um, the shutdowns have had on food availability and unemployment. Um, the numbers are high, um, but there has been at the regional, at the country levels, very varied but similar initiatives around food aid, cash directly transferred in places like Kenya directly to their people, um, the international community stepping in at various levels, whether it's emergency relief now, health support. Um, so we've seen a variation of responses. So I think the, the, the actions and the initiatives taken by a lot of the heads of state across Africa to shut down a lot sooner a lot of um, support, both regionally with the AU and internationally, has helped. Um, we still need to see where this ends up. We still need to see where this narrative ends up regarding COVID specifically. Um, the impact as well, I think there is still ongoing debate on the merits of a lockdown in some of the countries and whether it should have been done or not and whether the style of lockdown that mirrored a lot of the Western lockdowns was the best approach for Africa, particularly African countries where, um, you know, you can have quite a few. I think one Indian economist called it instead of uh, social distancing, social compression, because suddenly, no. you know, people who are in homes of 10 or eight have to see each other in every day and you're actually more exposed um, to the disease. So like anything when it happens the first time you're learning um and i think we as the data comes out we will see whether in addressing covid did we leave the door open for other diseases that are ongoing like malaria like diarrhea like you know other diseases that we know are issues so it's a mixed story today um regarding how we've handled covid and the impact uh i think on the glass half full there are some trends we're starting to see that maybe outliers but are starting to look quite interesting um, in different sectors technology we're really seeing an acceleration um, i think globally everyone has seen a boom in e-commerce and that is very true equally for africa so i think you know areas where there was already a lot of innovation and research around e-commerce the logistics optimization, last mile delivery, which has been some of the challenge in Africa. I think people are now looking at it in a fresh way, at least I'm seeing a lot more activity and innovation happening around that. I think we're going to see more opportunities through the continental free trade agreement um, that's happening across Africa. You know, when supply and demand globally shuts down, you have to look more internally to your regional and local supply chains to address the problem. And, and I think we're seeing an opportunity when the trade program comes forward to actually maximize on that. Yeah, I, I think. Okay, let's talk about Andy. Sorry, Henry, yes, please. Yeah, Andy, sorry, so apologies, Josephine, for butting in. I thought you were done there. <laughs> Are you done? No, no, um, yes, you can, you can go ahead. Because I just wanted to endorse your point that 
One thing we've learned here is not to implement a solution that someone else who may seem clever and may seem to know what they're doing should uh, just copy that. So the, the, and I think the, some of the African countries very much copied the lockdown procedures of developed countries where they had money to pay for furloughed employees, where they have different kind of systems, where the health system is much bigger. And we will still count the costs of the malaria babies. We will still count the costs of the inoculations that didn't happen. And uh, on the other hand, I do believe that the, the emerging market populations, by and large, and particularly the poor countries, have very resilient populations. Mm. And have populations which do not live in zero risk worlds, like, for example, people in some European countries want to live in. And that gives them an ability to respond and react to, 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 to very deep crises, uh, which is often underestimated. And, and, and what, one point I'd just like to leave is, is most emerging markets, there, there is no desire to turn inwards. The desire you see in the United States to turn inwards, to cut off the world, the, the, the sort of pre political pressures people face in the wealthy countries to uh, do everything local and that. The, the, the emerging market people, by and large, want to compete, as they have been for the last 20 years, very effectively, for jobs from the developed world. And I think this, this moment is not going to stop that. In some countries, the fragility may put, put business back very far because businesses may be closed uh, uh, full time as they lose space in supply chains or as 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 the countries uh, the, the political leadership in the countries become all, all the more populist to stay in power but but I think the essential approach from people in emerging markets so simply to get up in the morning do their very best and now with technology available and freely available they are just going to capture that. And, and that's where my optimism for emerging market comes in. It's not a cyclical optimism. It's a very, very long term uh, view. Yeah. OK, there's there's the there's 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 the optimistic view. Let's 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 see what our audience uh, uh, thinks about this. I want to go to our first audience poll. Here's the question. What does the future look like for emerging economies? And you've got four options. V-shaped recovery, U-shaped recovery, L-shaped recovery, decade of lost growth. Perhaps the only one missing is the W-shaped uh, uh, recovery. But there's, 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 your, there's your four, uh, four options. Jo Josephine, what, what would be your answer to that question? Yeah, I, I think once again, it's, it's just too soon to give something definitive. I, I think somewhere between a U and a V is the the general discussion that i've seen and and the the that you know there will be a downturn there will be upturn it, it's just a question of how long are we going to be in a downturn before we go up so i i think it's one of those that there'll always be varying opinions i, I i'm i'm too optimistic to believe in the l i think we're we're more looking at a v or a u and general debate and consensus is somewhere around there and then depending on the data, depending on if there'll be a resurgence, as we emerge and learn and get more data, really will impact the length of time. But right now, it's just too soon to, um, to sort of be that definitive. And I think- Re we've got Briefly, Hendrik, which one would you choose? We've got to differentiate between the energy uh, producers yeah. and the rest, because the energy producers have been hit by something much harder than even the COVID hit uh, of late, which we don't really, we haven't really mentioned. Whereas the energy importers are getting the benefit, and those who are going to open and restructure their economy. And one, my last point is just, I've seen countries where governments have been too passive, and where they've not used the crisis. And and those are the ones in the emerging market universe I'd be scared of. Those who can't grab the opportunity and deal with a structural adjustment that's necessary. Josephine, as I mentioned in the introduction, you used to run the mm -hmm. Uganda National Oil Company. How does, how does the collapsing energy prices play out in, a, in an economy like Uganda? 
So it, it's really interesting. Um, there was a study that just came out from Reichstadt about the current sort of um, flood of oil and gas assets that are on sale. Um, I think they estimated there's about 5 billion barrels recoverable right now available on sale globally, big proportion in emerging markets. Um, equally, natural gas, I think, is the equivalent of seven and a half million billion, sorry. So there's suddenly this big glut of people trying to sell assets for various reasons. Some was happening before the crisis. I think the crisis has accelerated that. Um, and majority of the sale is around producing assets or pre-designed, pre pre-feed type assets. Um, so somewhere like Uganda, where we're, we're, we're sort of pre, pre, we're in development phase, low prices help us because a lot of the services will be cheaper. And hopefully by the time we start producing, the prices will be higher. But what is an interesting dynamic that I'm observing and I'm, I'm seeing in my network is a lot of these assets, at least that I'm coming across in Africa in oil and natural gas that are becoming available are being bought up by indigenous African oil and gas firms. And so it will be quite interesting because suddenly the, the prices that they're going at, it's almost a bit of a fire sale, is now accessible to them. So it'll be a really interesting trend to watch over time if this increased ownership by indigenous African oil and gas firms of assets across the region and trying to consolidate them, what that looks like in three to five years. So it's, it's a sort of interesting time in oil and gas. Obviously, there's people really trying to sell, but there's, it's sort of created this window of opportunity um, for indigenous African oil and gas firms. Okay, let's, let's look at the, uh, the way that our audience uh, views the world, pretty much in line with our speakers. 64% see a U-shaped recovery, only 14% see a, a lost decade of growth. Looks, that seems to be a reasonably optimistic uh, forecast for emerging, for emerging economies. Um, I want to go now to uh, an um, interview that I did uh, yesterday um, uh, with Luis Alberto Mareño, who's the president of the Inter-American Development Bank. Let's listen to, to that conversation uh, focused on Latin America. Good morning, Luis. Welcome to the program. You were at the helm of the Inter-American Development Bank during the 2008 financial crisis. For Latin America, how does COVID-19 crisis compare? Well, this is uh, almost like the Spanish flu and the Great Depression at the same time, uh, because clearly uh, during the financial crisis, it was probably the first financial crisis that didn't start in Latin America in a long time. Uh, the one that we had, it was, as you know, in developed markets. And at the time, the, the, the debt to GDP ratios in Latin America were about 40%. The, the fiscal surpluses on average were about 0.3%. Uh, which meant that Latin America had the, 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 the capacity to weather the storm. And this is not only what Latin America did, but most emerging markets bounced back very quickly after the financial crisis. And they essentially began a process of growth that helped and brought up the rest of the world. Today is very different. We start with, I guess you could call it pre-existing conditions where we have 2.8% of uh, average fiscal deficits about 60% of uh, debt to GDP ratios, but the combination of a drop of uh, in remittances, is the monies that uh, Latin Americans send back home is gonna be a drop of 30% that affects mostly Central American and Caribbean countries. The profound drop in tourism that again, you know, doesn't help many of the countries in, in the Caribbean, but throughout the region. And then the compression of, of commodity prices and finally, a sudden stop of financing all at the same time are going to bring Latin American countries to very negative growth. We estimate this year uh, to the tune of five and a half percent. OK, I want to ask you about an op ed piece that you wrote for The Washington Post last week in which you note this desperate scramble for face masks, other medical protective gear. Uh, in Latin America, which you blame on global supply chains shifting to Asia. Uh, this pivot to Asia, uh, you say, was short-sighted. And you conclude that there is now a huge opportunity to bring a lot of this manufacturing back to the Americas and to build new regional trading arrangements. So a couple of questions. First, first of all, 
how will Latin American economies manage to invest in a manufacturing renaissance in the middle of the crisis that you have just described, the biggest financial and health crisis um, in a century, perhaps in history? I, 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 Andy, I look at this more in terms of the consequences of COVID. And one of them certainly is going to be a lot of re regionalization of production. And supply chains, as we know them, are gonna change significantly. There's already a lot of pressure to nearshore. And the big factories of the world clearly are in Asia and Europe and in North America. Question is, how can we you know, move to something not just made in America, but made in the Americas? And clearly with medical equipment is already happening because we, in this kind of wild west supply kind of problems, countries started to have to produce respirators using 3D printing, uh, all kinds of medical equipment at home. And, and I think increasingly what you're gonna see is what we, a smart import substitution process where you can regionalize production. And I think this can begin to help Latin American countries to have more trade within themselves. If you look at Asia or Europe, uh, trade within those regions is above 50 or 60%. In Latin America is namely only 18%. So we have a big space to grow. And clearly with the US and North American market, I think we can do far more. That of course is gonna imply not a pivot to Asia, but a pivot away from Asia and into the Americas. Okay, so you, you, you say in this op-ed that countries in Latin America and the Caribbean must upgrade their ports, their airports, their broadband networks, and so on. This is going to cost billions of dollars. Where's the money going to come from? Argentina has defaulted on its debt. 16 countries in the region, of the, 16 of those countries have gone to the IMF for emergency financial assistance. Who pays for it? Clearly... Part of the growth story going forward is going to be a lot of public investment. I mean, this is, I guess, is a, if, if we put it in a word, is Keynes's back, as we remember during the Great Depression. It's going to be a lot of push coming from governments, regardless, because of what you just mentioned. Uh, but clearly, uh, you know, I think there's space for private investment around, you know, expansion of bandwidth and and increase of bandwidth penetration, and I think that's something that is self-financing. And in terms of infrastructure, with absent that, we're not going to be able to do the kinds of uh, phys uh, you know, physical integration and, and trade arrangements uh, beyond simply trade agreements, but rather the, the hardcore part, the, the, uh, the hardware of, of the integration that is needed. And that's going to mean, you know, like in the discussion in the United States already, which is you should put more money into infrastructure because that has a huge economic multiplier. And that's what's going to begin to push growth back up. Let's get to, to China. Surely China gets a say in all this. Um, I, I mean, you know, it's one of the biggest, it's, it's, it is, I think, the biggest lender to the region. And the plan, as you laid out, sort of upends this relationship between, potentially, between Latin America and China, which is Latin America shipping uh, raw materials to China and in return buying electronics and other high-end uh, Chinese manufacturers. Is China going to go along with this? Look, I mean, I, I think uh, Chinese consumption of uh, Latin American commodities has been a good thing for Latin America. It basically helped propel much of our growth. It's not saying to do things away from China or Asia in general. I think Latin America, like any country in the world, has to find a way to grow more, and it's got to be through trade. Uh, I think the opportunity, however, is to do more within the Americas. And certainly, if you observe uh, the trade that we currently have, Largely, the trade with China is concentrated in five commodities. Our trade, let's say, with North America is far much, uh, far more diversified. And I think that's precisely the opportunity. And what about the United States? Is it really possible to conceive of a big, bold, pan-American trading arrangement when you have a president in the White House who despises multilateral trade deals and is busy erecting protectionist barriers? Look, of course, this, I think COVID uh, will definitely imply a rethink of many things. Uh, already, there's plenty of uh, free trade agreements across Latin America with the United States. In fact, every country on the Pacific, from Canada all the way down uh, uh, to Chile, has a trade agreement with the United States, with the exception of Ecuador. So we already have a, a set of trade agreements in place. Uh, 
Uh, I think there is definitely a possibility to have something bigger. Uh, and that's really the challenge. I think it, regardless of that, uh, I think we got to do our own in Latin America within the, the region to do much more of, a, of regional trading and, and increase it that way. But I think at the end, uh, you know, if history is any, any lesson, uh, it was after the Great Depression, the bounce back in the U.S. economy that helped Latin American economies come back up. I hope we can do the same. Before that happens, are we are we likely to see a financial crisis in Latin America, another lost decade? Well, look, I think there's still a lot of things that that we don't know. Uh, certainly, those risks are there. I would, you know, I, I think definitely what we're seeing already in terms of the contraction of our economies, the increase in unemployment, uh, and the increases in poverty are huge. Uh, but without a doubt. Uh, you know, a lot will depend on how the rest of the world economy uh, bounces back. That will help or not uh, Latin American economies. And in terms of debt, yes, we're going to have challenges with debt. Uh, you know, as I was saying, just from January this year, where we were about a little less than 60% debt to GDP ratio, we could be looking at close to 70, 75% at the end of the year. And that happens like with when you use your credit card, you know, you first get the the goods and then you have to start worrying about paying them and I, we won't see that discussion until you know i would say into next year uh but that's going to be a huge challenge and i and a huge challenge not just for uh, latin american emerging markets but throughout the emerging market world do you think china is going to come to the table when it comes to debt i mean there's a lot of talk china china has uh uh, has already announced, or is, we, the, the Global Times, as a matter of fact, yesterday had a, uh, an article saying that China is going to scale back its lending to the region. Do you think that it's going to uh, forgive some of this debt, or is it just going to be, you know, a question of freezing debt repayments? Where, is, where does China stand on the whole issue of debt in Latin America? Well, look, in the context of the G20, they, they were big advocates of, of uh, having, a, as it was done, a you know, kind of the debt forgiveness that has been talked about for the poorest countries. Uh, but uh, Latin America is largely middle income countries and we still have, a, you know, there is nothing there in terms of debt forgiveness, not yet. Uh, but I think uh, as we go forward, I mean, there's there, there was the Brady plan that was done in Latin America years ago uh, when Latin American economies uh, coming out of the what was called then the lost decade of Latin America. Uh, used uh, zero coupon bonds to basically put a floor uh, to help countries uh, work themselves out of the debt overhang they did. It, was, it wasn't it was a question of getting more debt. Countries could not take on more debt to grow. So, I mean, I think it's too early to start uh, into this discussion. I just hope that that we would, that uh, you know we manage this in a good way. I think the fact that the U.S. has done the kind of stimulus it has done, it's very important to basically support the, the strength of the U.S. economy. Final question on business. Rich countries have spent colossal sums of money bailing out businesses, big and small. Who is going to come to the rescue of smaller Latin American businesses? Look, I think like happens in all of these crises, there's going to be processes of consolidation. There will be even strong Latin American or multi-Latina companies as they're typically referred to. Uh, with some are healthy, some uh, will have the capacity to absorb others. Uh, there will be lots of uh, business opportunity. Governments will probably have to take on some strategic industries uh, that have a, a, a challenge like you've done, for instance, with airlines in the, in the US. I mean, things like that, we're gonna start seeing a lot. Uh, I hope, uh, uh, you know, that, that that is something that we find a way to quickly work ourselves out of this uh, and but but it's, it's mechanisms that all countries are looking at to try to uh, you know keep uh, their the the private sector going Luis Alberto Moreno thank you for your insights it's much appreciated thank you Andy Okay, we just heard um, Luis Mourinho uh, Hendrick talking about creating a giant trade and manufacturing zone in Latin America. I know from pre uh, previous conversations with you uh, that you have something similar in mind or you imagine something similar 
uh, for Africa. Is this a future of globalization with somewhat inward looking regional blocks trading with and also competing against uh, each other? I, I think regional trade, Andy, is just something that needs to be encouraged across what was previously known as the emerging market or emerging world, because it, it was used to be intermediated by the, the previous colonial powers or the dominant powers of the day. So if you actually open our borders, now Africa is so far behind, if you want to fly from one African capital to another, you've got to go mostly through London or Paris uh, or nowadays Dubai, maybe Istanbul. You cannot do it from country to country, it's just, except maybe in East Africa where they've got their act together. So if you open those corridors, you increase efficiencies massively. Now, what, what they've done, they've already created the communications infrastructure, mobile telephony, broadband, etc., cetera, are starting to work. Uh, so it's, it's not difficult. Europe lies, the huge market lies very close. India, China, very close to Africa from, from, ship, from the shipping point of view. It should be possible. And may this crisis spur the countries who need to do it into action because Africa has been very, very slow at achieving its, its, its intra-African trade growth that it's been speaking about for years. Yeah, okay, I want to bring in an audience question and, and throw... Sorry, please, before we do that, yes, go ahead, so, Josephine. Yeah, I was, just, I was just going to compliment that. I think, you know, it just really just adding that this, if this crisis did nothing else, we, you know, during the scramble for masks and, and all kinds of health equipment, when you know countries in Africa were also having to compete with bigger players around the world for sort of a limited resource for a while. I think it just made very sort of distinctive the need to start having local manufacturer, local supply chains, realigning our supply chains regionally. Um, and I think this crisis just heightened that and ho hopefully will drive some action to say, you know, we don't want this to happen again, but in future, if there ever is a crisis, we have the internal capacity, particularly if borders close again. But Josephine, is, is, is regionalism truly a vision for global prosperity? Isn't it a recipe for inefficiency, protectionism, nationalism, but most importantly, doesn't, doesn't it favor the rich world? Well, I mean, there's got to be a collective discussion. Um, I think we, we do need to find that balance between multilateralism and all collectively having this global trade environment, but also needing to develop trade, manufacturing, productivity in a region um, that's still very agro dependent, um, where we have huge unemployment. We need to create that environment where we're fostering growth. And I think it's not going to be easy by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and, and I think that, you know, in the previous conversation you were having, it became evident, whatever region you're dealing with, that balance between global trade, regional trade, um, and even within the region, we have stronger African countries and we have more emergent within Africa itself. And how do we ensure that, again, the, the, the million dollar question, how do we ensure from the smallest to the biggest, there is some balance? But definitely, um, I think what COVID has done is shown us for Africa as a region, we need to take advantage of the free trade agreement and hopefully lift um, the opportunities on manufacture. I think Josephine is absolutely right. Question from the audience. This one from... Sorry, can we... I'm sorry to interrupt, Henry. There's a question from the audience that I think that I think you might be interested in here from uh, uh, Camelia uh, uh, Dumitriu. Uh, Dimitru, who is the Professor of Strategy and Risk and Crisis Management at the University of Quebec at Montreal. Um, and um, she asked, how will globalization change in the post-COVID-19 era? Will countries be adopting self-sufficiency policies when focused on rebuilding their economies? Hendrik. Uh, that's a very, very good question, Professor. Um, we, we did a a paper and a piece of work on it and, and our view is that this will also be forgotten in due course so people will initially focus on self-sufficiency because you always fight yesterday's war tomorrow you will initially focus on self-sufficiency and then price will come in we don't see this as a world of complete deglobalization. we see that post-covid the big move is the change in the global order 
We have seen, seen Asia distinguish itself in its competence relative maybe the, the rest of the rich world. We have seen uh, different methods work well, and we have seen the rise of technology which is available to both governments and the private sector. So in, in short, necessary localization and onshoring, but we don't think this can last forever because ultimately mm. uh, trade is what drives wealth and people will always go back to trade. And let's think about where emerging markets started, started with the East India Company or Marco Polo. Okay, let's go to Dan Let's go to Dan Bisa uh, Moyo. She's a global economist who sits on the boards of 3M and Chevron. And I spoke to her yesterday about her recent op-ed uh, calling for more aid for Africa. Take a listen. Dan Bisa Moyo, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. A decade ago, you famously criticized foreign aid for developing countries, saying that it fueled corruption and fostered dependency. Now you're calling on the United States and Europe to launch a Marshall Plan for Africa to save the whole continent from the ravages of COVID-19. What's behind this change of heart? Well, Andy, it's actually not a change of hearts. I've been very clear in the article that the view that I espoused 10 years ago is still very much valid as far as I'm concerned today. Um, which is to say that any type of aid intervention that is open-ended and is given in perpetuity is extremely damaging politically and economically to the recipient countries. And you've just highlighted um, a couple of the reasons why, the issues of dependency, corruption, but also concerns around inflation and Dutch disease. Um, the article is very clear that the types of aid interventions, such as those of the Marshall Plan, um, are and can be effective. Um, and I was very clear in my book 10 years ago also. The point being that the Marshall Plan, which was from 1948 to 1952, was a short, sharp intervention and finite. And critically, it was not created, it did not create the types of dependency that we've seen um, in aid programs more recently. Um, moreover, the, uh, the aid program of the Marshall Plan was about $135 billion. I'm suggesting that, the, that Africa, um, given the complexities of the continent and the size of the continent, would require something much, much greater than the $62 billion that was originally pledged by the IMF and the World Bank to tackle the COVID impact. Um, the, the more important thing is that I believe that there are three key reasons that um, uh, mean that this um, argument for a Marshall Plan for Africa is extremely valid. Um, one is really we're in the middle of a global pandemic and the ability to assist African countries to combat the health epidemic uh, pandemic, I think is, is it would be enhanced by this type of an aid program. The second reason is really an economic one. Um, we've seen a lot of stabilization and stimulus packages across Europe and the United States. An aid program um, such as the one I proposed in The Economist magazine would really help not only to provide a stabilization of very challenged African economies, but also really be a, a catalytic in terms of being an opportunity for stimulus. And then finally, really, I, and, and this again is in the article, um, I think there's a moral imperative um, certainly for Western countries as they continue to pursue ideological beliefs in uh, liberal democracy and market capitalism, the argument here being that Western countries are lagging behind um, China, is spe specifically as we've seen China in the last few decades, certainly in the last decade, um, really uh, amp up its uh, efforts in terms of foreign direct investment and trade across not just Africa, but the emerging world in its totality. We'll, we'll get back to China in a minute, but, but let's talk about Africa. Has Africa changed? Are the conditions that prompted your criticism a decade ago no longer relevant? No, um, they are relevant in, in large degree. Um, it certainly is the case that the economy, as economies in Africa remain extremely vulnerable. So, for instance, um, we, we know that according to the World, World Health Organization, um, really co governments should be providing about 35 to 40 dollars per person per year um, in order to uh, ensure economic uh, health care is provided to their population. And many countries in Africa are just not able to do that. Um, we also have the issue of slow and low growth. Um, many African countries continue to fall way below the sort of 7% 
number that really we need to see in order for them to double per capita incomes in a generation. According to the rule of 72, that number is really more like a 3%, but given the low levels of, of economic uh, development at the, on the baseline, um, I, I believe that the, the numbers would have to be much higher in order to see real meaningful progress in a generation. And then obviously politically, um, we are seeing that you know on the whole, things are much more stable than we certainly saw in the 90s where the Stockholm Institute talks about Africa having more civil wars and more civil unrest than the rest of the world put together. I mean, it has stabilized in some respect, but I think it, there's still many vulnerable hotspots and concerns around uh, uh, around uh, uh, spats from uh, the global the disorderly migration, but also concerns around uh, terrorist activity, um, environmental degradation. I mean, I think this confluence of factors are, are real areas that Africa continues to be challenged with. Well, the West most certainly has changed. Certainly in the past few years, it's more inward looking, there's more talk about self-reliance. Trump's America shows no inclination whatsoever to lead the world, quite the opposite. Uh, it's COVID-19 has brought on this sort of dog eat dog international mentality between countries. What makes you think that the US and Europe right now can rise above all this and pour funds into Africa? Well, look, I'm, I always pride myself as being a realist. And um, I was very clear in the article that some may view this as fanciful and actually really ill-timed as, as, a, uh, as a proposal because of the, the issues that you just raised. We're in a world of you know, quite a lot of evidence of deglobalization. But beyond that, we also know that many of the, de the, the developed countries that, are, that we're looking to across Europe, across the, uh, including the United States, have enormous debt and enormous deficits. Um, and certainly in debt terms, have, we haven't seen the, the debt to GDP ratios um, you know, that we're seeing today in, over the past 100 years. And so really in a vulnerable place themselves. But again, I think that this is not a, a, a really a, 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 a call for, for sympathy or for some kind of, a, of a, um, a sort of a, a gener asking for generosity just on the top of it. It's really a claim to the moral um, imperatives of, of the Western society. If Western society wishes to continue to be a leader, wishes to continue to innovate, and certainly in the case of immigration, wants to avoid disorderly migration, which we've seen um, over the last few years, and certainly in Europe, I believe that they need to, to be invested um, in, a, in a much more active way across the African continent and in the emerging markets more generally. So geopolitics informs some of the thinking behind your call for a Marshall Plan, right? I mean, you see this Absolutely. as you say, a way for the West to regain influence on the continent lost to China. Some might say that this shows something of a Cold War mentality. Why not ask China to join in? Why not make this a big global US, European, Chinese effort to rescue Africa? Well, first of all, China's already there. So I don't think they need um, to be uh, co-opted or convinced. Um, they are um, the largest foreign direct investor, the largest trade partner, and now the largest lender in terms of debt um, across many countries, both developed and developing, but certainly across Africa um, for many, many countries. And so um, it doesn't seem to me to be a pitch that needs to be made for, um, for, uh, for, the, for the Chinese um, political class. Um, whereas I think this is a, a story and a narrative that, um, and that I basically was, was worrying about 10 years ago when I wrote Dead Aid, because my concern was that there was always going to come a day where we would have a, a lack of enthusiasm around delivering aid um, to Africa. And, and my concern was that African countries would be ill prepared for it. And, and I think we are all ill prepared for the global pandemic, but you know, clearly African countries, which hold a lot of international debt and are struggling, not just in terms of that the cost basis of the amount of uh, debt uh, return, returns that they have to pay on, on terms of interest, but also as a top line revenue number, um, the fact that they can't, commodity prices have softened and the, the prospects for global growth have weakened um, on the back of this, uh, of this virus um, really means that the, the narrative around Africa is becoming even more challenged. So as you say, China is already a major player in Africa. Much of, it much of the uh, investment is channeled through Xi Jinping's Belt and Road Initiative. Lending uh, in, within that program has already reached several hundred billion dollars. 
What do you think, what impact do you think this crisis is going to have on Belt and Road? Does it put it on hold or does it, could it be powerful enough to derail it altogether? Well, too soon to say is what I would say. Um, you know, I was somebody who was very much of the belief of a v, V-shaped recovery early on. Um, but, um, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of serving in a number of corporate boardrooms and I spent a lot of time with public policymakers. And I realized quite quickly that that was a little bit uh, a foolhardy because clearly there was some deeper entrenched st- structural problems that have come to bear. Um, in the case of China, you know, the broader emerging markets have actually not had a very good story uh, since 2000 and. Uh, 2007, which is, I believe, when we saw the last um, highs in, in the market. So since then, we've had a really challenged environment um, in versus, versus emerging markets. So what do I think China is going to do? I think that there is and remains a longer term imperative for them. And so they, in many ways, they could pick up a lot of assets on the cheap um, already because of their very powerful position as a uh, uh, a lender to many governments in South America, across Africa, and, and broader emerging markets. I think that they have an, the upper hand and a lot of leverage in this environment to be able to renegotiate terms. Um, and we've seen some of this in terms of distressed assets. And and you know we know that in some cases it's not just about extending the you know changing coupons and extending maturity dates. It's really about getting a quid pro quo in the form of natural resources, um, which I think China will continue to be quite uh, aggressive on. I can't imagine that they wouldn't take advantage of this opportunity. So if you look on a reserve basis and you look on the fundamentals of how the political class in China thinks about these things, it seems to me that they will continue to be quite aggressive. Last question uh, on on emerging markets generally. One of our uh, New Economy Forum delegates, James Crabtree, wrote recently in Foreign Policy, I believe, uh, that the pandemic brings an end to the very idea of emerging markets, that fast-growing, poorer countries uh, become the darlings of financial investors. Is that assessment too harsh, do you think? Well, listen, I have spent um, a lifetime being very pro-emerging markets. I felt that the underlying factors, um, capital, labor, and productivity were very compelling as an investment thesis. These countries had relatively low debt. They had both quality and quantity of, uh, of young population that could drive um, economic growth. And of course, in terms of productivity, there were importers of technology, there were importers of a lot of ideas, rule of law, et cetera, that were, had proven over time to be beneficial to growth. Um, but that actually has not materialized. And I think that's somewhat disheartening um, for someone like myself to, to, uh, to accept. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, it's been several decades that we've, many people from the BRICS to, to uh, many others uh, have been extremely optimistic of what would happen in the emerging markets and they've continued to lag behind. So, you know, fundamentally, is, are there a group of countries that have a narrative um, where we've remained optimistic, but it's continued to disappoint? I'm afraid the answer is yes. Um, and in a world that's becoming more deglobalized, more competitive, more zero sum, I fear that um, you know there's, there's going to be a, a sort of dare I say it come to Jesus moment um, around uh, around what the path forward is going to be. I mean, I, I worry deeply that we see a reversion towards more uh, import substitution, um, much more of the the sort of tried and tested. Um, models of economic uh, economics that actually did not deliver sustained economic growth, um, but we are in a p- point of um, desperation in many ways, and I think the confluence of many factors from income inequality and climate change and debt and deficits and and also um, concerns around uh, demographic shifts, I think, um, makes it a very very uh, lethal cocktail. Dan Bisamoyo, thank you for taking the time to be with us. Andy, thank you for having me. So while we were listening to Dambisa Moyo, questions uh, came uh, pi- are coming piling in. Um, Dambisa talks about this lethal cocktail. Um, here's a question that might put things in a different light. Um, and it comes from Peter Burden, who's an advisor based in the UK at the Siaka Africa consulting firm. And he asks, we hear about the chance to reset Africa after this crisis. Do you see any opportunities that may come out of this pandemic? Josephine, would you like to take that one first? The answer is yes, yes. Um, I touched on technology. I I think we're going to see a real 
sort of acceleration and things happening, like I said, in e-commerce. Um, I think blockchain technology is going to pick up just where we need more traceability and track, you know, transparency around transactions. Um, I would also say in the renewable sector, there's some really interesting dynamics happening. You know, the whole issue of energy access is becoming so much more critical in the light of COVID-19. Um, and we realize that more money is going to need to be spent in the healthcare sector. We're going to need more regional health um, centers. To do that, we need energy. To do all the technology work and get all the broadband, we need power. And, and to get into these more... Um, off-grid remote areas or in the distributed areas, renewable energy now is more accessible, is more available, prices have come down, technology has improved. And what's great to see and what I'm seeing in my network is the private sector really leapfrogging ahead, particularly in the commercial and industrial space to drive more um, innovation around renewable energy. So not dismissing or, or minimizing the challenges, but I think there's a lot of opportunity um, that this this crisis presents to us to take advantage of and see some shifts in how we do things on the continent. Hendrik, a question for you from Josephine. Uh, sorry, a, a question uh, for you from Muyaka uh, uh, Ulubi. I'm, I'm, my, I'm terribly sorry, I, my, I'm, I'm massacring his name, who's the FA Group Leader at GFA Consulting Group in Nigeria. And she asks, what advice would you give SMEs, small and medium sized enterprises with regards to business continuity strategies post COVID? What will be the biggest challenge for SMEs post COVID? Thank you very much. Uh, and a very appropriate question. Just before that, I, I must just challenge Dambisa's lethal cocktail conclusion. There are countries which have a lethal cocktail but I again want to remind her and everyone else that the Asian emerging markets have been a, a tremendous success and in fact are now competing for leadership in the world, not just, and that's why you're getting the split world. So let's just be quite clear about dynamism in emerging markets. There are some big winners and there are some losers. I'm a bit worried about Africa like Dambisa, but the SMEs in Africa have a huge opportunity given the technology that's available right now. The platforms, firms like Alibaba and others are rolling out, allow you to sell your product to anyone in the world without great friction costs that you used to have and to deliver that. And I've seen a number of businesses that are being built in fairly low cost places with dynamic populations that aren't over-regulated. And as long as the states and the government stay out of the way, uh, this can work. And, uh, you know, for example, well, we had the bizarre situation in South Africa where the government banned domestic e-commerce as part of its COVID strategy, which was completely, completely wrong. They've luckily stepped back from it after huge pressure. But I do believe 3D printing, all of those opportunities and with bandwidth, and, and we're invested in tower companies across the continent, bandwidth is being delivered. Mm. And with that, you can compete in, many, in far greater ways and far more effective ways than before. So please look out for the cheap technologies available on the big global platforms like Alibaba. And if I just compliment one more question on from that. IO. Oh, sorry. Please? No, I was just Go saying ahead. there was all you know on the on the SMEs and technology. I think there's a lot of what I'm seeing is a combination of local innovation with some of the innovation coming out of Silicon Valley, coming out of China and Africanizing to our informal way of micro SMEs and um, and and really that and it's actually quite exciting what's happening on the payments and e-commerce and and last mile delivery world by pulling from the best of other countries and bringing it into our sort of localized informal way. So I think there's positiveness for a lot of these SMEs and micro SMEs. Uh, okay, um, from Ayo Bajomo, who's the treasurer at the Bank of Industry in Nigeria, and he asks, uh, uh, or she asks, sorry, um, uh, how can partnerships be forged to attract and channel funds into emerging economies for industrialization and at the same time create benefits for all stakeholders, local partners in emerging markets, local populace, fund owners, etc. 
Hendrik, would you like to have a go? I owe, on? Yeah, I owe my, and that is where the limit, where governments can become hugely limiting factors. I think it's absolutely vital that uh, there's domestic pressure on governments to allow space for international and for foreign investors who are very often staffed with locals who very often understand the environment well, but they need to be able to operate. And for example, in Nigeria, one of the big issues over the last few years was foreign exchange because there's an unrealistic uh, foreign exchange market you know, being set by government. Governments need to open up. And my sense is that this COVID pressure and these weak economies will actually force governments to step out of the way and give entrepreneurs and investors a chance and simply make rules and, and for ensure that, that all parties observe them properly. Uh, so that, that's my hope. And, and, but if that doesn't happen, then uh, you know, business, small businesses will suffer or will continue to suffer. Josephine, we're going to give you the last word on this. No, I, I agree with what Henrik said. It's going to be a combination of um, government sort of freeing up to let um, the force, market forces interact, technology, um, and, and you know, I, I'm, I'm a big optimist and believer in the human spirit. And I think even through this crisis, um, and the collective working together, there's a lot of opportunity and, and new ways of working that we will see for emerging markets. We're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time. Josephine and Hendrik, thank you again for joining us today. We're grateful for your participation and for your perspectives. I'd also like to extend my thanks to Dambisa Moyo and Luis Alberto Moreno for taking the time to join our conversation and to our audience, both within and beyond the Bloomberg New Economy community. Thanks for joining us. We invite you to our next conversation, Public Health on Life Support, focused on the challenge of rebuilding global public health in the wake of COVID-19. That's on Tuesday, June the 16th. Follow the conversation with at New Econ Forum on Twitter or like us on Facebook. And to learn more about other upcoming events, please visit our website at neweconomyforum.com. Thank you and stay well. Mm -hmm.